Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm always apprehensive when people clap before I speak. I hope you feel similarly after I speak. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for being here. The very fact that you're here suggests that you already are informed about sleep and feel it's important, either from the point of view of uh, that your sleep is good and you want to maybe learn a few more tricks, or that your sleep is bad and you want to learn how to make some adjustments. Uh, I'm hoping that by the end of today's lecture, both of those needs will be satisfied. Uh, we'll do questions at the end. I may occasionally ask you some things, but then it'll usually be a show of hands or something like that. So I'm going to start off with something completely different from what I normally do. I'm going to do an infomercial. Do I have a deal for you? There's a product that can improve your concentration, sharpen your memory and planning skills, help you maintain a healthy weight, improve your mood, improve your sex lives, and decrease your risk of accidents and possibly of developing major depression, diabetes, cardiovascular illness, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. Does that sound like a good deal to you? Okay. What if I told you the product was 100% natural? What if I told you that it was free? What if I told you that it had a lifetime guarantee? And there are no shipping or handling charges. All right, now, are you interested? Yeah. Well, that's what we're here to talk about. I'm here to talk to you about, basically, I'm going to wake you up to the importance of sleep, sufficient sleep. And for you, it's important, not just for you, but for the people you care about, your family, your friends, children, your parents. So I'm going to talk a bit about why we, as a nation, are sleep deprived. And then I'm going to talk about the causes of poor sleep and what can be done about it. First, let's talk about a nationwide pro uh, problem, self-imposed sleep deprivation. Now, I'm a bit of a historian. So I'm going to start off with a quote from General of the Army and President of the United States, Ulysses S. Grant. He said this before the second day of the Battle of the Wilderness, a crucial battle late in the Civil War. We shall have a busy day tomorrow. And I think we had better get all the sleep we can tonight. I am a firm believer in the restorative qualities of sleep and always like to get about seven hours of it myself. Though I have, hard to read the white, I'm sorry, uh, often been compelled to put up with much less. I just loved that quote when I found it. He's obviously in a state where he hasn't oops, been sleeping as well as he might. But if you had his worries, you might have similar problems getting good sleep all the time. Well, this quote really, to me, illustrates two very important things. First, it emphasizes the importance of sufficient sleep and the resultant good performance that results. Grant won the war, after all. Second. Under certain circumstances, getting sufficient sleep is often compromised, but at a cost of poor performance. Daytime functioning, your ability to do everything that you do during your waking days, your waking hours. Well, we as a nation tend to willfully restrict our sleep in the service of just about everything else. It's the first thing that goes when we need more time to do things. This has become almost standard in our way of being in our electrically illuminated 24-7-52 world. Darkness has lost its inevitability. There is no darkness anymore. Many of you have seen those pictures of nighttime in the earth with the illumination of the entire world. Basically, wherever there are people, there is light. So we've banished the night. And as a result, we've banished the time that facilitates us to sleep. And then there's the coming of the internet, computer screens, smartphones, iPads, touch screens, and all of the social media that provide constant connectivity. How many of you know people or have a child that spends half of the night under the covers facing into a blue screen, typing away? 
instead of sleeping. Maybe you're one of those people. <laughs> Don't know. But certainly, it only has added to the problem. Many hard chargers, you know, type A types, whatever, take pride in sleeping four to five hours a night. They brag about it and about how much work they get done as a result. They're the ones that send emails at three in the morning. 45% of teens in the United States report sleeping less than the nine hours recommended a night. And more than 25% of them reported falling asleep regularly in class. Probably not the most conducive thing to their educations. Well, we're learning, as more and more research emerges, that this I'll sleep when I'm dead approach may well be a self-fulfilling prophecy. You can non-sleep your way to death. Chronic insufficient sleep has costs, but often we refuse to recognize them. And we run into them all the time. Excuse me while I find a home for my children. They could only afford a tiny podium. Let's say, a little thought experiment. Let's say that you need very important surgery. You're in the hospital, your physician comes in, the day of the surgery to do some final consult with you, get the signed consent form, chatting with you. And while he's there, he reaches into his pocket and pulls out a flask of whiskey and pours himself half a shot and bangs it down and says, you have no need to worry. I'm a large person. I moderate this level of alcohol, and I'm never above 0.05, which is way below the legal limit. Would you be concerned? <laughs> Well, 18 hours of continuous wake, that is, if you wake up at 6 and you stay awake till midnight, is the equivalent of a blood alcohol level of 0.05 in terms of its compromise on daytime performance, measured cognitive performance. If you stay up a little longer, the, the deficit increases. And if you stay up close to 24 hours, you're pretty much at the legal, you're the equivalent of the legal limit blood alcohol of 0.1. But we don't think in these terms. We recognize it if it's drugs that are doing the impairment. But we don't recognize it if it's sleep deprivation, willful sleep deprivation. This is a hard driving surgeon, right? Doesn't have time to sleep, gotta do a lot of things. We don't recognize it there. There's another reason we don't recognize it. Many individuals are in total denial that insufficient sleep is a problem. You might be one of them, conceivably. Ironically, when you're sleep deprived, your judgment of your daytime impairment is impaired, even though you don't realize it. And people in this situation feel that they're functioning normally, even though if we measure their function objectively, you can demonstrate significant impairment. So the very act of willfully getting, giving yourself insufficient sleep causes you to not be sensitive to recognizing that you're not getting enough sleep. I'm doing fine. I'm tough. I'm ready. I, I can go. So how do we get to here? How do we get to getting regular sufficient sleep? Well, the first part of the battle for good sleep is to recognize whether you are someone who self-imposes a chronic state of sleep deprivation on yourself. Are you one of those people that truncates your sleep because you have a lot to get done, because you need to get these things done? And something's got to go, so it's going to be sleep. Well, if you are, you probably are doing yourself a disservice. The second step is to take corrective measures to ensure that you have regular and adequate opportunity for sufficient sleep. Regular is important. Adequate is important. That's the only way you're going to get sufficient sleep. Admittedly, it's easier said than done, of course, because we live in the real world. But that's no excuse for perpetuating a problem that can compromise performance, health, and safety. Remember time lost in obtaining sufficient sleep can well be compensated for by improving your daytime function. 
Isn't it better to be able to do the things you do during the day better, even if you have a little less time to do them, rather than have more time to do things poorly? You know, to me, the trade-off is pretty obvious. It's getting there that's the issue. However, even when we give ourselves adequate opportunity to sleep, we may not be able to get the sufficient sleep we would like to. There may be other issues that might leave us here. Sleep can be disturbed for a wide variety of reasons, not just willful sleep restriction. I'm not saying that's the whole cause of things. Sleep can be disturbed because you have a sleep disorder like sleep apnea or restless leg syndrome or REM behavior disorder or a circadian rhythm disorder or a physical or mental illness or the treatment of one of those because treatments also have impact on sleep potentially. Well, I could do a long lecture on that stuff, but I'm not here to do that. We have to just recognize that those are some of the causes for disturbed sleep beyond willful sleep restriction. So it's not part of today's presentation. What I want to do today is discuss first self-improved insufficient sleep, which I think I've done, and second, insomnia, or disturbed sleep with sufficient opportunity to sleep not caused by any of the things that I mentioned. And I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about that and then hopefully giving you some tools to try and correct that problem if you have it. So let's just examine the clinical diagnoses for insomnia disorder. This is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. This is the fifth version, brand new, hot off the presses, and this is how insomnia is now defined. So it's a predominant complaint of dissatisfaction with sleep quality or quantity accompanied by one or more of the following symptoms. And these are the four classic symptoms of sleep disturbance that's an insomnia. Difficulties initiating sleep, so you have trouble falling asleep. Difficulty maintaining sleep characterized by frequent awakenings or problems returning to sleep. So you wake up during the night, and it's not just that you wake up occasionally, but you have difficulty falling back asleep. And that difficulty can sometimes take 20 minutes, a half an hour, an hour or that you have early morning awakening with inability to return to sleep. So you have to have at least one of those. Distress or impairment in your date, in any one of a variety of areas. So it has to be impacting your daytime function. It can't just be that your sleep's a problem, but your daytime is a, is a breeze. Got to be daytime problems. The sleep difficulty occurs at least three nights per week. So it has to be of a certain frequency. And the sleep difficulty has to be present for at least three months. These two factors are a change. They're in advance in the criteria that we use for diagnosing insomnia. We never used to talk about frequency, and duration was something unspecified. And people would approximate a month often to come up with chronic insomnia. But we don't do that now. We have very specific criteria. This is for diagnosis, remember. The sleep difficulty occurs despite adequate opportunity to sleep. So you're not one of these people that's willfully giving yourself insufficient sleep by schedule. The predominant complaint of dissatisfaction with sleep must be accompanied by one of the following. This is counterintuitive. Advances on the bottom instead of the top. Um, sorry. The sleep difficulty cannot be better explained. It does not occur exclusively as the result of another sleep disorder, like the ones I mentioned. And the sleep disorder is not attributable to physiological effects of the substance. So a drug or a medication that might be treating something. And coexisting mental disorders and medical conditions do not adequately explain the insomnia. So the insomnia is there regardless of whether they wax or wane, for example. Well, that's the clinical diagnosis. But a lot of people wouldn't meet those criteria for the clinical diagnosis, particularly in terms of the frequency and the duration, because they would have more periodic disturbances. And there's a lot more people that have that than have the insomnia diagnosis. But nonetheless, it has important impacts on their ability to sleep and their ability to function during the day. And you may fit into that category. Some of you may be diagnosably insomniac. I don't know. 
But regardless, there are things that can be done to treat that problem and to mediate it. Now, for many people, the bed is not a place of solace, <laughs> but a place of anxiety. It becomes almost a signal to be anxious, a signal to worry, a signal to ruminate. And that marks the, the mental processes of a lot of people that have difficulty sleeping. We'll talk about that a bit. Now, I'm going to talk about the most straightforward thing to do to improve your sleep. This is not just my wisdom. This is collective wisdom. Back in 2005, there was a consensus conference held at the National Institutes of Health. We brought in all the big sleep experts. And we looked at the state of the art and the ways we can treat insomnia and insomnia-like symptoms, being a subclinical insomniac. You know, you don't have to meet those diagnoses. You could be subclinical. And we reported what we felt were the ways to treat it, the best ways to treat insomnia-like symptoms. Notice the last thing that we said should be used, pharmacotherapy. There are lots of reasons why it's last. I'm not going to go into it today because I'm going to focus on the front end. The first thing that was suggested we do is we optimize the patient's sleep habits, what we used to call the sleep hygiene practice. So a review of their sleep habits and suggestions for correction. If that fails, you can go to a more formal cognitive behavioral intervention where you go and see a practitioner and they work with you around improving your sleep. And I'm going to talk about both of those factors. I am not going to talk about drugs, both because I'm a psychologist and I could do a lecture on drugs. And that's not why we're here. I want to give you tools you can use. So what about sleep education, which is the first start? A lot of people have misassumptions about sleep. Oh, I'm going to die if I don't get sleep, is you know, the more exaggerated version of that. But a lot of people don't know what sufficient sleep is for them or for their age or for their health. A lot of people don't understand that there are things that impact their sleep that they could do to either improve or, not, or make things worse. And so the first thing is good information. And you know, I was criticizing the internet <laughs> and, and all of that, but we have much more information at our fingertips now. And here are some websites. Don't write them down. These slides are all going to be available to you, so you'll be able to find them. But there are at least three websites that I think have very good information about sleep in general, about sleep disorders, about insomnia, and about treatments for them. So if you really wanted to get into this and research the area, you could go to one. This first one's Harvard. The next one is uh, something by the uh, American Academy of Sleep Medicine. If you wanted to find a sleep clinic, you could go to the American Academy's uh, website per se, where it's find a clinic in your area, although you guys, I assume, all know that the University of Washington has one down at Harborview. And then there's also the National Sleep Foundation, which also provides useful information. These are resources that you could learn about sleep, about sleep disorders, and about possible treatments. What I want to do for a goodly amount of time here, though, is to talk about good sleep habits, to review them with you, because these are things that are good, easy fixes that you could employ in your own lives if you feel you need to do something to improve the quality of your sleep. Wrote about it way back when. These are the things that are under behavioral and environmental control for you that can either compromise or improve sleep. And depending, the list can be long or short, but usually you end up with about 10 items. The first, oh, and a couple of caveats. If you're a happy camper about your sleep, don't worry about this stuff. If you want to improve your sleep, think about this stuff. Possibly make changes in what you do, but don't do all changes in all things at the same time. Because it may be that there's one factor in how you sleep that's really the problem, and if you address it, everything else will fall into place. On the other hand, maybe a couple. But be a good scientist. Move one variable at a time. 
Otherwise, you don't know what's causing the good change. The single best thing that one can do, and it's tough, is maintain habitual bed and rise times. In particular, get out of bed the same time each day. What you need to do is align your sleep period with your body clock, your circadian clock. Now, I'm not talking if you're a shift worker, you're in trouble, just in general, so I'm sorry. <laughs> That's another whole universe, another whole series of lectures. If you're a shift worker, that means you're flying across country on a regular basis, and you're experiencing the periodic problems that we see in jet lag, and it's a different universe, and you can't keep regular bed and rise times. And you can't keep alignment. And it's, so it's a different approach, and you'll have to seek out another. Maybe I'll come back and do another lecture on circadian rhythm disorder, if you feel OK about how this one went. In particular, get out of bed the same time each day. And that means weekends, too. Anybody want to volunteer why it's get out of bed, not go to bed at the same time, but get out of bed at the same time? Well, really, over time, if you get out of bed at the same time, it will help fix your bedtime. Because your body regulates sleep. It's under what's called a homeostatic drive. You have to sleep a certain amount unless you willfully play games with it. And if you allow your body to tell you when to sleep and you get up at the same time repeatedly over and over and over, things will fall into place. Your body will start to recognize, well, I'm, if I don't go to sleep now, I'm going to be tired the next day. Because you're not going to sleep the next day. You get up, and so you're basically increasing, if you will, your sleep debt by getting up the same time over and over and increasing the likelihood that you'll be able to go to bed at a reasonable time and fall asleep at a reasonable time. So if you only did one thing, <laughs> well, there are two things, but I'll come to the last one later. But if you only did one thing, get up at a regular bed uh, rise time. Here's another one. Go to bed when truly sleepy. If you're doing the first, you're probably going to feel truly sleepy at this roughly the same time most nights. And if you have trouble falling asleep, we don't want to turn the bed into that thing with teeth, right? Where you're unhappy and grumpy and your adrenals are pulsing and you're basically having a fight or flight response in the middle of the night in bed. So get out of bed if you don't fall asleep in 15 or 20 minutes. Go somewhere else and do something relaxing. And then as you feel tired again, go back to the bedroom and see if you can fall asleep. And you can repeat that. Actually, one of the rules that I'll tell you later is you repeat that as long as necessary. This is something I have arguments with my colleagues over. Explore the usefulness of napping. Assume, given that you're all here and you're probably working at the U, you probably don't have time to nap. But when you retire, think about that. <laughs> napping can or cannot be useful. It depends on the person. It depends on the situation. Some people need a little nap in the afternoon to have the energy to go on for the rest of the day, especially older adults sometimes do that. But you want to be regular about the naps. You want to keep it short. And you want to recognize that if you nap during the day, it may steal a little bit of your nighttime sleep because you don't have as much sleep drive. So you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. You have to decide which one of them you want to pay. So I always talk about explore the possibility of naps and see how they work. Ensure your bedroom environment is sleep-inducing. This sounds trivial, but it's oh so often a problem. Lighting. You may be light sensitive. And with our wide seasonal variation and illumination period here in the Northwest, that can be a problem. So you want to make sure it's sufficiently dark for you. Again, especially if you're having problems. Bedding is important. Temperature is important. Arguing with your spouse about what the temperature is, is important. <laughs> you got to work it out, however it works. You know, whether you cut the, the coverlet in half or not, it doesn't appear on one side of the bed. Uh, but this is important, and it sounds trivial. I once had a phone call from someone who was having trouble sleeping, and they wanted me to fix it for them then. And so I did a quick sleep hygiene screen with them and was going through things. 
And the first thing you ask when it's a sleep problem is, how long have you had it? And they said, oh, a couple of three months. I said, oh, OK, interesting. So we got to the, the bedroom thing. I said, anything change in your bedroom environment in the last few months? And I said, well, we got some new pillows and bedclothes. And I said, you did. You got new pillows and bedclothes. Do you know what they're made from? Oh, yeah, they're these really nice goose down things. And I said, well, given that it lines up with when you say your problem started, it may be that you have an allergy, that you get allergic to this stuff. It interferes with your nasal passages and your breathing at night, and it's disturbing your sleep. Do you still have the old stuff? They said they did. I said, well, why don't you pull it out? Again, experiment one thing at a time. Pull it out, put it back on, call me in a week. Now, I wouldn't be telling you this if it wasn't a miracle cure. <laughs> I'm not setting myself up as you know a, a great clinician, because I'm actually not a clinician. But what I am trying to illustrate to you is that bedding and the environment can be important. And it's not necessarily the barking dog across the street. It can be things under your control. Develop relaxing bedtime rituals. How many of you read in bed? OK. A goodly number. I read in bed. It's a nice bedtime ritual. It relaxes me. I get in bed. I have the light on over my head. I read the first page. Sometime later, I realize that the book is down in my chest. So I close the book, and I turn off the light, and I go to sleep. Because I've transitioned from the daytime and all the things that I do during the day to the nighttime and going to sleep. That's a good bedtime habit. Now, reading in bed could be a bad bedtime habit, too. You just got your new mystery in the mail, or your new romance novel, or your new sci-fi novel in the mail, right? George Martin finally published his next tome, for example. So you get it, and you go to bed, and you read it. Three hours later, you're still reading it. This is a bad bedtime habit. And if you are prone to that kind of thing, you would behoove yourself to find a different habit <laughs> or a series of habits. Floss your teeth extra slowly. I don't know. Whatever it is, whatever it is that works for you. I guess this is exploratory, remember? OK. Don't be a nighttime clock watcher. My wife was a professional sleeper. Fat, she is. Really, I hate her. Uh, <laughs> I don't hate her, but I hate that part of her. Uh, anyway, she found this alarm clock which fascinated me. It projects in large red letters on the ceiling the time. There is nothing worse that one can have than that kind of clock. You don't need to know what time it is at 2 in the morning if you're in bed. All you need is an alarm that will help you wake up at the time you need to get up the next day. You turn the clock around. Because otherwise, what's going to happen is, if you're that kind of person, you're going to look over at the clock as you woke up in the middle of the night, as we all do occasionally, and you're going to see that it's 2.15. And what you're going to do is you're going to say, damn, I'm awake. It's 2.15. I didn't want to wake up. I have a big day tomorrow. I, don't, I want to get to sleep. I don't need this. And you're annoyed, right? And you're making yourself annoyed. And you're getting the adrenals churning. I mean, you're getting a, an arousal response. And that's not what you want to do. And what's worse is there's a good chance you'll fall back asleep in five minutes. And then wake up again a half an hour later and look over at the clock and see that it's 2.45. And you're convinced you've been awake that entire 40 minutes. <laughs> and you probably haven't. So turn the clock around if you're like that. You don't need it. The other thing that's related to this is scheduling a regular worry time. If you're one of these people that uses the bed to go over all the terrible things that happened that day, and anticipate all the terrible things that are going to happen the next day, right? This is not good. This produces teeth in the pillow, like that illustration showed, right? So have yourself contract with yourself. I'm going to have worry time in the morning when I have my coffee. And I've got to, I'm going to have a little pad by my bed. And when I have something that bothers me that I'm going to ruminate about while I'm asleep or while I'm in bed, I'm going to write it down so I don't forget it. And now it's captured and safe, and I can use worry time for it. It's a technique. It might be useful if you're one of these warriors. All of us do it occasionally. I mean, this was a different kind of lecture for me. So I was, you know, I, some of my, my lecture popped into my dreams. 
this last night. But fortunately, I knew it was going to be over by 1 o'clock today, so I didn't write it down. This is the way. <laughs> anyway, uh, exercise regularly and moderately, uh, preferably not late in the evening. Late afternoon is usually a good time. But you don't want to exercise just before bedtime because exercise is an arousing thing. And, uh, you know, so if you go out for a gentle walk in the evening as opposed to a 10-mile run, that's fine. But exercise has been shown to increase sleep drive, and that's good. Make light work for you. Seek daytime light. No, that's hard in Seattle in the winter. But daytime light helps get your circadian rhythms in line and helps line up your sleep period with it. Avoid bright light at night. We've learned now that nighttime light suppresses melatonin secretion, which helps you sleep. Melatonin helps you sleep. Secretion of melatonin helps you sleep. Nighttime light suppresses melatonin. But bad. Guess what wavelength of light suppresses melatonin the most? Blue. What are all your screens <laughs> on all your devices? They're blue, they're in that way. So, you know, doing that stuff is a double whammy. Getting up and throwing on all the lights is bad. Have enough light that you need to get to the bathroom to do your bathroom thing if you wake up periodically to do that as we all tend to do more of as we age. And set up the light so that it's on the floor, not in your eyes or not illuminating the bedroom or the bathroom, but it's where you need it to be, where you're gonna put your feet. So have the night lights. If you're going to use night lights, which is a good thing, set it up that way. So let light work for you and don't let it work against you. Avoid rich foods late in the evening. No pepperoni pizzas at 10. Right? Seems obvious, but for some people it's not. Explore the usefulness of a light bedtime snack that might be sleep-inducing. All of these compounds all these food compounds, that's a scientific term for food. Uh, all these foods, milk, bananas, turkey, cheese, peanut butter, contain tryptophan, which is an amino acid that's a precursor of a major sleep hormone and increase the likelihood of you falling asleep. So you can make yourself a banana, turkey, cheese, peanut butter sandwich and have it with a warm <laughs> glass of milk. Just something to think about. Avoid caffeine, alcohol, and tobacco. Each of these interferes with sleep in its own way. Now again, if you don't have problems sleeping, don't avoid. I'm Italian, I have trouble avoiding alcohol. So the other two are not a problem. A lot of people are differently sensitive to caffeine. There are people that can get away with a double espresso and it doesn't bother their sleep. There are others that take a weak cup of coffee at five in the evening and have trouble sleeping as a result. You have to determine who you are, what you are, and what you want to change. Be aware that over-the-counter and prescription medications can adversely affect sleep, right? So it could be your doctor prescribes something and they tell you to take it a certain way and it maybe interferes with your sleep if they told you to take it in a different timed way. If you're a person that's sensitive to sleep problems, when your doctor gives you a new prescription, you might ask it, does it impact sleep? Is there a timing that will minimize that impact? So, so I take my diuretic in the morning. Taking my diuretic before I went to bed would be kind of counterproductive. Okay. And of course, follow through on these things. Explore them one at a time. See how they impact your sleep. See if they're beneficial. If not, move on to another one. You, know, you have to personalize this stuff because you are the person that's treating yourself, as it were, in this circumstance. Or you can get more serious. And you can uh, find a practitioner of cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy is this module. It's a group of techniques. Sleep education is one of them, as I've shown here. Good sleep hygiene is another. Right. Using a sleep diary or a sleep log is another. And I don't have an example, but there are several sleep diaries here. And these are just basically grids that you can chart your sleep over a period of several weeks and see if it's improving if you're doing some of these manipulations I've told you about. One of the things that's very useful, you know, and the first thing you should do if you're really doing this well is you, you do a week and then you make a change and then you see how the next week or two is like. 
one of the nice things about charting behavior is you really get to see how big the problem is. Sometimes you chart the behavior and you realize the problem isn't that big. Or you chart the behavior and you find that there are certain antecedents for bad night's sleep. Like if you've been out at a party or you've had a fight with your spouse or whatever it may be. And things that you can then correct to make sure that you don't have those antecedents of a poor night's sleep. So diaries charting is really useful. You know, at least psychologists are into plotting behavior. Because there's a certain truth to these. You know, it's just like charting your weight loss, which can sometimes be very discouraging, sometimes very encouraging. But it gives you an objective of what you're seeing and we're trying to do. I am not going to talk, in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about stimulus control therapy and uh, time in bed restriction therapy because these are employed in cognitive behavioral therapy. And you could learn about them if you'd like to, and certainly you'll have the steps available here. But usually you're doing this with someone, someone to guide you, typically a trained clinician. And you're doing it at a sleep center or seeing a psychologist or a nurse practitioner who does this kind of work out in the real world. And usually we employ this kind of approach if you're a diagnosable insomniac. So if you have that frequency and duration criteria that I talked about. Here's another tool for you, though. This is something that I find very easy and very useful. This is a simple deep breathing relaxation exercise. And relaxation is often part of cognitive behavior therapy as well. It's the simplest possible relaxation exercise. There are very elaborate muscle, progressive muscle relaxations where you tense and stress muscles and things like that. There are very elaborate uh, cognitive imagery based relaxation techniques. All you have to do with this is breathe and attend. Anyone out here have problems breathing? Okay, so most of you will be able to do this. Very simple. You can do it lying down before bed. You can do it in the middle of the night if you wake up and you find yourself thinking about the wrong things. You can do it during the day, seated and relaxed for a while. Because this does other things other than improve and slip you into sleep. This is very good for lowering blood pressure, for example. So, you simply close your eyes, and you think about your muscles being relaxed. You don't get involved with it. You just try and go limp, right? Go heavy. We can all do that. I just did. Not completely heavy, because then I would fall. And the lecture would end poorly. But you try and relax. Slowly breathe in and breathe out. You can use a mantra. You can have a sound that you use when you exhale. One, song, om, whatever. But you don't need it. You don't even need that. You don't need the sound. What you do need is this. Attend only to your breathing. So you're focusing on the breathing. That's all you're focusing on. Your attention is on your breathing as you're lying in bed trying to go to sleep and having a tough time doing it. So you're going to do this instead of get up or before you have to get up or in the middle of the night when you've awakened and you feel you may have trouble going back to sleep. So basically, you attend only to your breathing. If you get distracting thoughts, as many people do, and almost everybody does when they first start learning this technique, that's OK. We're always distracted like that. Just recognize that you're having a distracting thought and come back to your breathing. Breathing, breathing, slow, nice, steady, and slow like that. And you maintain that passive attitude and permit relaxation to occur at its own pace. You don't say, oh, I've got to be right, relaxed. It's five minutes. What's wrong? Because right? that's the adrenals are going again. That's bad. So, What this does is basically shift your autonomic nervous system from being sympathetic, that is aroused, to being parasympathetic, that is being relaxed. And it can facilitate you falling asleep, and it can facilitate you falling back to sleep. And during the day, it can facilitate you coming down from an argument you had with a colleague or to just refresh you. You know, instead of uh, going to the coffee machine for a break, sit in your chair and try the Benson relaxation response, which is what this is. You can look it up, Benson relaxation response. He's the guy that stole it from India. 
So this is a tool. Use it, see if it works. It's the, it's the simplest thing that I recommend and it's useful in so many basic ways around sleep. The neat thing is if you need it, cognitive behavioral therapy is very powerful. It improves insomnia both in the short and the long term. And that improvement is as good if not better than the improvement we see with pharmacological agents, but without the side effects, without the cost down the line. Because you learn cognitive behavioral insomnia, cognitive behavioral treatment for insomnia, and it's good for life. You can employ those rules. So it's like give a man a fish and he eats once, teach a man to fish and he sleeps well for the rest of his life, <laughs> to mix the metaphor. We also found that not only is CBTI, as we call it, efficacious for uncomplicated insomnia, but even for comorbid illness. You heard from Stephanie that I'm doing research with osteoarthritic older adults that have significant pain, which is very difficult to treat pharmacologically. So we're looking at the impact of improving their sleep and whether or not it improves their pain. We're actually getting some very interesting results that are pretty positive moving forward with that research. And that comes to this last point that CBTI-based improvements in sleep may also result in improvements in comorbid illnesses. And it may not just be CBTI. It may be that just improvements in sleep, regardless of how they occur, can have positive impact on other illnesses that, may, that that person may experience. We're learning more and more that sleep is extremely powerful. It's not just turning off the light and turning off your brain. It's actually quite the opposite. All kinds of things happen while you're asleep. And your body needs that sleep in order to allow those things to happen. This is some resources for CBTI. Uh, these are two that I mentioned previously. They're websites with general information. If you want to sign up, although it's at cost, for an online interactive CBTI treatment, this is a website that does that. It's pretty good. I'm not, I don't get kickbacks from any of this stuff. But there are some sites that, uh, that work. If you're into the self-help book world, these are two good references that you might be able to find. They're pretty recent. So those are all possibilities. Practitioners, if you wanted uh, somebody to help you guide through this, can be found at the regional sleep centers or the Washington Psychological Association or this other society of behavioral sleep medicine. And there are more and more practitioners because we've been trying to spread the word about CBTI for the last number of years. So I hope that all made sense. And I hope that you all sleep well tonight. <laughs> and I will be happy to answer any questions you have over the next 10 minutes. Thank you. If, if one can't, simply can't get back to sleep, because for whatever reason, no matter what sort of relaxation techniques you're trying, your mind just keeps spinning. spinning. Uh, can you know, how, how is, it, is it OK, and how much rest do you actually get if you just you know, try to relax and stay in bed versus yeah. getting up, especially if you're like in a hotel room where somebody else is there? And right, right. Uh, in, as a general rule, if you can get up and get out and go to another place and, do the, and try and relax there and then come back to bed, it's a much more powerful technique. Uh, actually, that, you're talking specifically about stimulus control therapy, where you're learning that the bedroom is safe for sleep and not anxiety. If you stay there on a regular basis and stay awake all that time, you're really conditioning yourself to not sleep in the bedroom. Now, there are situations that you mentioned, like a hotel, where you may be compromised, and you, you can't. But even there, if you could get up and go to a chair with a quiet light, and do a little reading, or get up and go to a chair and do a relaxation response, like I said, or even lie in bed and do the relaxation response, you'd be way ahead of the game. That's the best I can offer you. OK, thank you. Please. Hi. Um, is it true that as you get older, you need less sleep? No. It's true as you get older, you sleep less. It's. <laughs> yeah, I, I OK? <laughs> okay. Now, no, but let me, let me amplify that. We know that older individuals sleep somewhat less. But that change in sleep starts occurring in the early adult years. 
And by the time you're out at, in your 60s, yes, you are sleeping somewhat less than you would have at 18 or 20. But what we've recently learned, and I had to completely change how I was writing, was the best data we have right now says that if you stay healthy from 60 to, to 100, <laughs> your sleep won't change much. So it doesn't continue to decline. It does drop, but it doesn't you know, go down and down, down and down, so that when you're 100 years old, if you're healthy, you're not sleeping three and a half hours. You're actually sleeping seven as a, as a population. So that's part of the answer. The other is we don't know, we can't really answer what's needed sleep. And the best answer I have for you, and nobody asked that yet, when I'm talking about sufficient sleep, that is sleep that allows you to function well throughout your waking day. The amount of sleep, whatever that is for an individual, and notice I've given no prescriptions, because sleep need does vary somewhat. The average for an adult is seven hours, but there's variability. Some people do well on less. I'm actually one of the people that pretty much sleep six hours a night, and that's pretty good for me. I seem to have functioned okay here. I know the weight thing is a different story, but that's because I'm Italian. Um, but, but really, uh, sleep need is a different thing, but we really don't need to talk about sleep need to talk about improving your sleep. Please. Uh, you mentioned to get up at the same time, even on weekends. So if I get up at 5 o'clock Monday through Friday, that means Saturday morning and Sunday morning, 5 o'clock also, even if I have a big if party you, on Saturday night or something? Remember rule number one. If you don't feel your sleep is a problem and you feel no need to improve it, no, it's a problem. don't pay any attention. <laughs> if it's a problem, you don't want to sleep in until 9. <laughs> if you're getting up at 5 because you have to go to work, well, maybe you can compromise a little, so six. Right. But what you can't do is have these wide swings. Because what you're doing, this is a classic example, when you hit the weekend right, and you allow yourself to sleep in, you'll do that on, Saturday, on Friday night. On Saturday night, you'll do it again. And on Sunday, what's going to happen when the alarm goes off? You're not going to be able to, you'll have truncated your sleep hugely, and you'll be producing what we used to call a Detroit Monday car. Please. Hi. Um, I usually get about eight hours, need about eight hours. Mm -hmm. My significant other is one of those people that says he functions well on three or four. He lies, but that's a separate story. <laughs> he says if he gets more than that, he's excessively sleepy the next day. Now, is that, a, is that how some people can tell they're getting too much? And um, well, Or is he crazy? No, I, I can't say he's crazy. I, I haven't met him. Uh, <laughs> No, no, I, I'm only joking about all of those things. Most people that say they get by on three or four hours of sleep are not really aware of how much sleep they either need or are getting. All of us experience something called sleep inertia, that when we sleep and we wake up from it, our brains are not automatically good to go. We need 10 or 15 minutes. It may be that when he sleeps a little longer, he's got a sleep debt anyway, and he's sleeping quite deeply, <laughs> almost getting remedial sleep, and then he may be waking up from deeper sleep than he's ordinarily used to when the alarm clock kicks him up. At, you know. So here's a question. If you're on holiday and you don't have an alarm clock or something, what does he sleep like? Does he sleep three hours? No, he'll, he'll, he needs to get up and go do something in the morning. But that's not what I asked. How long does he sleep? He's sleeping longer, I'll bet, on vacation. Or Maybe a little bit. Yeah, but an hour, an hour and a half, that's a lot when, yeah. from baseline, if it's truly three hours. So, I mean, but the bigger problem is your mismatch, it sounds like. Yeah. And, you know, uh, there are ways to deal with that. They're not pleasant. Uh, they range from other bedrooms you know, dueling beds, uh, you know, the I Love Lucy way of approaching marriage. Uh, or, you know, you have to, you have to just work We've it out. We've kind of worked that out. I was just yeah. curious, is he really getting Yeah, I, I would argue that if I studied him for several days in a lab, that it would be more than three hours. Five or six, probably at the least. But he could. There is genetic variation, so you could be a short sleeper. If you'd like. What, last question. Sorry, guys. Yeah, I, I've been getting pushback from my uh, father for uh, uh, 
trying out a CPAP because he says he wakes up four times, five times to get up and go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering when you have a problem keeps waking you up, what's the best way to tackle it? He definitely has sleep apnea too. He's got heart right. issues. I think it would be a great thing for him. Uh, right. Okay. So the question is CPAP is, most of you probably know, is you know, airway pressure that is just strong enough to keep your airway open if you have sleep apnea where normally you would block it. Okay. Sounds like your dad has significant sleep apnea so that if he's not on CPAP, he thinks he's sleeping through the night, but he's doing all those little wake-ups and he's sleep deprived and so he sleeps. But if he's on, but if on CPAP, he's now getting up and going to the bathroom. Okay. Now. But did he previously? His excuse for one of his reasons for not doing a CPAP is like, well, I get up and go to the bathroom four times. Oh, I miss I'm going to have to take this CPAP, this thing off, and put it on. And he's like, but I think it's going to get him better sleep. Well, well actually, one of the things you can suggest to him is that CPAP may improve your sleep sufficiently where you find that you don't have to get up as many times. Yeah. You may only be getting up twice, in which case you're having your problem and improving your health as well. Confront him with an experiment. Challenge him with, let's see, let's, let's explore it. We good? Thanks, guys.